While finishing up my unpolished reflection on abortion and euthanasia, I began reading a collection of the Marquis de Sade's work. In my reflection, I poorly explained that while I may be burying myself alive under the crushing weight of debt and, de de debt and de discrimination, and that my true preferences would be to die or withdraw entirely from society to spare the world my toxicity, I do feel an obligation to find ways to share with the world as long as I choose to be a part of it. I have adapted one of Saad's physical di philosophical dialogues, getting tired apparently, his 1782 dialogue between a priest and a dying man into a 24-minute monologue. The editors of the Marquis de Saad, Justine Philosophy in the Bedroom, and other writings consider this to be one of his tamest works. I struggle severely with memorization and staging my space for skit filming on any reasonable timeline, so I will read. I am also a technophile, currently quite creeped out by technology due, the same, due to some personal experiences that compound the general tech gets creepier as we age trend. Between that and working with old technology under frustrating constraints, I am again choosing to deliver this piece underprepared and unnecessarily divided into parts. Part three of hopefully three. Only two things are needed to accredit an alleged miracle. A mountain bank and a few simpletons. Tush, there's the whole origin of your prodigies. All new adherents to a religious sect have wrought some. And more extraordinarily still, all have found imbeciles around to believe them. Your Jesus's feet do not surpass those of Apollonius of Tiana. And yet nobody thinks to take the latter for a god. And when we come to your martyrs, assuredly... <clears throat> Assuredly, these are the feeblest of all your arguments. To produce martyrs, you need but have enthusiasm on the one hand, resistance on the other. And so long as an opposed cause offers me as many of them as does yours, I shall never be sufficiently authorized to believe one better than another, but rather very much inclined to consider all of them pitiable. Ah, my friend, were it true that the God you preach did exist, would he need miracle, martyr, or prophecy to secure recognition? And if, as you declare, the human heart were of his making, would he not have chosen it for the repository of his law? Then would his law, impartial for all humankind, be em because emanating from a just God, then would it be found grave deep and clear in all beings alike, and from one end of the world to the other, all men having this delicate and sensitive organ in common would also resemble each other through the homage they would render the God whence they had got it. All would adore and serve him in one identical manner, and they would be as incapable of disregarding this God as of resisting the inward impulse to worship him. Instead of that, what do I behold throughout this world? As many gods as there are countries. As many different cults as there are different minds or different imaginations. And this swarm of opinions among which it is physically impossible for me to choose? Say now, is this a just God's doing? No. Fie upon you, preacher. Fie upon you, preacher. You outrage your God when you present him to me thus. Rather, let me deny him completely. For if he exists, then I outrage him far less by my incredulity than you do through your blasphemies. Return to your senses, preacher. Your Jesus is no better than Muhammad, Muhammad no better than Moses, and the three of them combined no better than Confucius who did, after all, have some wise things to say. What other theory could have satisfied my anxious spirit, my friend? That of nothingness. It has never held terrors for me. In it I see naught but what is consoling and unpretentious. All the other theories are of pride's composition. This one alone is of reasons. Moreover, tis neither dreadful nor absolute, this nothingness, 
Before my eyes, have I not the example of nature's perpetual generations and regenerations? Nothing perishes in the world, my friend. Nothing is lost. Man today, worm tomorrow, the day after tomorrow fly. Is it not to keep steadily on existing? And what entitles me to be rewarded for virtues which are in me through no fault of my own? Or again, punished for crimes wherefore the ultimate responsibility is not mine. How are you to put your alleged God's goodness into tune with this system? And can he have wished to create me in order to reap pleasure from punishing me? And that solely on account of a choice he does not leave me free to determine? Yes, I am free in terms of your prejudices. But reason puts them to rout. And the theory of human freedom was never devised except to fabricate that of grace, which was to acquire such importance for your reveries. What man on earth, seeing the scaffold a step beyond the crime, would commit a crime were he not free, were he free not to? We are the pawns of an irresistible force. And never for an instant is it within our power to do anything but make the best of our lot and forge ahead along the path that has been traced for us. There is not a single virtue which is not necessary to nature. And conversely, not a single crime which she does not need. And it is in the perfect balance she maintains between the one and the other that her immense science consists. But can we be guilty for adding our weight to this side or that when it is she who tosses us onto the scales? No more so than the hornet who thrusts his dart into your skin. Let the evil deed be prescribed by law. Let justice smite the criminal. That will be deterrent enough. But if by misfortune we do commit crime even so, Let's not cry over spilled milk. Remorse is inefficacious, since it does not stay us from crime. Futile, since it does not repair it. Therefore, it is absurd to beat one's breast. More absurd still to dread being punished in another world, if we have been lucky to escape it in this. Construe this not, my friend, as encouragement to crime. No. We should avoid crime as much as we can. But one must learn to shun it through reason. Through reason. And not through false fears, which lead to naught, and whose effects are so quickly overcome in any moderately steadfast soul. Reason, sir. Yes. Our reason alone should warn us that harm done our fellows can never bring happiness to us. And our heart, that contributing to their felicity, is the greatest joy nature has accorded us on earth. The entirety of human morals is contained in this one phrase. Render others as happy as one desires oneself to be, and never inflict more pain upon them than one would like to receive at their hands. There you are, my friend. Those are the only principles we should observe, and you neither need God nor religion to appreciate and subscribe to them. You need only have a good heart. But I feel my strength ebbing away, preacher. Put away your prejudices. Unbend. Be alive. Be human. Without fear and without hope, forget your gods and your religions too. There are none of them good for anything but to set man at odds with man. And the mere name of these horrors has caused greater loss of life on earth than all other wars and all other plagues combined. Renounce the idea of a master of the universe. There is none. But do not renounce the pleasure of being happy, and of making for happiness in the world. Nature offers you no other way of doubling your existence, of extending it, 